خير الخلق قدوتنا وتعال وزر وشاركنا وقم بالخير سابقنا لقانا في ابن تيمية وخير الخلق قدوتنا لقانا في ابن تيمية وخير الخلق قدوتنا لقانا في ابن تيمية وخير الخلق قدوتنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على عبده ورسوله وخليله وصفوته من خلقه نبينا وإمامنا وسيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سلك سبيله واهتدى بهداه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We're on the nullifiers of wudu in the author Rahimahullah Ta'ala said wa nawaqid fi at-taharat as-sughra thamaniya There's eight nullifiers of wudu Al-kharij min as-sabilayni Anything exiting from the two private parts Wal-fahish min ghayrihima Whatever exits from other than the two private parts that's repulsive Wa zawalu al-aqli bi ghayri nawmin yasirin jalisan aw qaimah Loss of consciousness is a nullifier and like it is sleep except light sleep while one is sitting and standing or standing and we mentioned the details pertaining to that. The fourth nullifier of wudu or actually the fourth and fifth is وَمَسُّ farji وَالْمَرْأَةِ لِشَهْوَةٍ Touching the private parts and a woman with desire. The sixth one is وَأَكْلُ لَحْمِ الْإِبِلِ Eating the meat of the camel, that's where we left off last halaqa. We took, pertaining to that nullifier, a total of four masail. The first one is, does eating the meat of the camel nullify wudu? We said yes. The second one is, what about other than the meat like the spleen, the liver, the intestines, the fat, and what's similar to that? And we said yes, that nullifies the wudu. Then we took, the mas'ala of the milk of the camel and we said there was more weight to indicate that the milk of the camel is not an nullifier and the fourth mas'ala was pertaining to the broth of the camel we said it's safer to make wudu from the broth of the camel especially if there's traces of meat but there's more weight to indicate that it is not a nullifier of wudu the next nullifier that's the sixth one the seventh one is Apostasy, الردّة والردّة. But before we start on that, there's a final issue on the the wudu from the meat of the camel. And it was actually a question uh, that someone asked me after the last class. Why do we make wudu from the meat of the camel? We don't do it from the meat of the sheep or the cow. Why from the meat of the camel? And I'll add to that and say. Someone eating the meat of the swine, their wudu is not nullified. Obviously, indefinitely, it's haram, sinful, but it's not a nullifier of wudu. Ibn Battal in Sharh al Bukhari said, someone mistakenly or purposely eats from the meat of the swine, his wudu is not nullified. A reason why someone may want to know the reason or the illa for this matter is due to qiyas. If we know the illa, there can be qiyas and there, can, there may be matters based on it. If you know the illa for the wudu from the meat of the camel, then qiyas may be applied. But to think for every ibadah, you need to know the reason or the illa. Or for every haram and halal, you need to know the reason and wisdom behind it. That's not correct. And worse than that is those who ask in disapproval. That's not acceptable. Now, whether you can do qiyas in ibadat, in worship, that's a disputed matter. And it's a matter in usul al-fiqh. The short, simple answer on that is that where the illa, the cause or reason is mentioned, qiyas and analogy can be applied by a mujtahid. And even as it pertains to that, it's only in a narrow sense. So the correct of two opinions that in matters of ibadat is that if the illa is known and confirmed, qiyas can be applied in a narrow sense in certain matters. 
You can't do qiyas to make up a whole brand new ibadah. But one can at times derive rulings from one ibadah to apply to the details of an already established ibadah, for example. The overall pathways that ulama and mujtahideen use to figure what the illa is, is first of all through an nas the Quran and Sunnah. Sometimes the Quran and Sunnah specifically tell you the illa, the reason, the cause for something. For example, why do you knock on someone's door to gain permission to enter? You don't barge into someone's house. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, la tadkhulu buyutan ghayra buyutikum, hatta tastanisu wa tusallimu ala ahliha. There's a clear hadith that tells us why that's legislated. In Sahih Bukhari, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was fixing his hair with a, something like a metal comb, and he said to a man who peeped into his house, if I knew that you had been peeping, I would have thrust this in your eyes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed seeking permission to protect from glances. So it's clear, the reason for seeking permission to enter the house is to protect against a glance you're not supposed to look at. Another way to find out the illa is through ijma, the scholarly consensus. For example, on that is if a child has an inheritance. His parents left him a lot of wealth. He's appointed a guardian over it. The reason for the guardian supervising his wealth is that child's age. The age is the illa by ijma. There's also a sabr wa taqseem, where the ulama gather all the possible causes or reasons or illa for the matter to check out which one uh, is the proper illa. And there's other ways, that's three of them. There's also a shabah wal ima wal dawaran wal munasaba wal ikhala. This topic is discussed in detail in usul al fiqh. Our classes, furu al fiqh. And if this class continues well, there's no problem in having a separate class to teach the usul. In matters of ibadat, knowing the cause or reason behind them is much less than other matters like al-mu'amalat, like the fiqh of dealing with others. Shatibi said the origin, rahmahullah ta'ala, he said the origin in ibadat is that it's ibadah, meaning we don't know the reason or cause or illa behind it. The number of months a woman has to do idda for talaq, it's ibadah. The number of rak'at is salah, three for maghrib, two for fajr, four for isha. Just like we wipe over the khuf, not under it. The majority of the ibadat, we don't know the illa behind them. Someone who made wudu, walked out of the, the bathroom and discharged wind. And wind, is then classified as najis. He needs to turn back around and go make wudu again. Why? It's a ibadah. Why is the discharge of wind an alafar? Yet burping is not. It's a ibadah. If we were informed of it in the sharia, the reason or cause, we say sami'na wa ta'na. If we don't know the reason or cause, we accept it, we adhere to it, and we adhere to the command and we say sami'na wa ta'na and we say certainly Allah has a wisdom behind it and we add to that la yus'alu amma yaf'alu hum yus'alun Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be questioned he's not the one to be questioned we're the ones who are going to be questioned the sharia says to make wudu from the meat of the camel just like with every detail of this sharia whether it's something we're supposed to do or something we're supposed to stay away from it's beneficial and full of wisdom even if the entire globe says otherwise. That's our belief. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala said, there's nothing in the sharia except that there's wisdom and reasons behind it. Sometimes people know it, sometimes people don't know it. In Sahih Muslim, Mu'adha asked Aisha radiallahu anha, what's the reason that menstruating women need to make up the fasting they missed, but they don't need to make up the salah they missed. Aisha radiallahu anha said, a haruriyatun anti? Aisha said, are you a haruriyah? Meaning, are you from the khawarij? And Aisha radiallahu anha may have assumed this lady was from the khawarij due to that question. Or Aisha radiallahu anha 
asked her question in response to the lady's question to indicate that this is the type of questions that the Khawarij ask. And that's the thinking of the Khawarij. The lady responded, she said, Lastu bi asal. I'm not a haruriya. I just, I'm asking to know. Aisha radiallahu anha said, Kana yusibuna thalik fa nu'maru bi qada'i sawmi wa la nu'maru bi qada'i salah. Simple and clear. In the past, we used to go through this when the Messenger وسلم, was alive and he would order us to make up the fast and he didn't order us to make up the salah. That's all there is to it. Simple and clear. Now as it pertains to this mas'ala, the ulama discussed the illa or attempted to find a illa for it. The issue of why we make wudu from eating the meat of the camel. The general overall opinion of the Hanabila is that this specific matter is a matter of ibadah. We don't, there's no, we don't know the reason. It's just a matter of ibadah. The second opinion is that it's meat touched by fire. We took the hadith pertaining to that. However, uh, the, the wudu from eating the meat of the camel is different than the issue pertaining to making wudu from that which is touched by fire. This is a very weak rationale because in the hadith where the messenger وسلم, was asked about the meat of the sheep, he gave the option to make wudu from it or not. But when he was asked about wudu, from the meat of the camel, he ordered it. So what do you get out of that? Had this been the correct reason that it was cooked on fire, the answer and ruling of the Messenger وسلم, to both the meat of the sheep and the camel would have been the same. For the sheep, he gave the option to do wudu or not. For the camel, he ordered it while both were cooked on fire so that proves that this is not the correct illa. A third opinion is they said the camel has a nature of the shaitan. And there's various interpretations to this. Under this third opinion, there's various slightly different interpretations. Some ulama said the reason is because the camel is surrounded by shayateen. And there's a hadith where the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam deterred from making salah near the camel's resting places. It's not due to najasa, but rather because there's shayateen around it, they said. The narration is, فَإِنَّهَا خُلِقَتْ مِنَ الشَّيَاطِينَ They were created from the devils. Ibn Hibban rahimahullah ta'ala explained this narration. He said that this narration means there's shayateen with it or near it or around it. What's his justification for this interpretation? He said, because the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rode on a camel and he made salah while he was riding on a camel. If the camel was an actual shaitan, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wouldn't make salah on it. Ibn Hibban said, it means the shayateen near it and around it. Another explanation, فَإِنَّهَا خُلِقَتْ مِنَ الشَّيَاطِينَ that the camels were created from the shayateen is that they have the nature of the shayateen. For example, in some cultures, if someone's son causes problems in Arabi, they would say, La to shaytan, don't be a devil. Or they would call him a shaytan, Ya shaytan, or Ya jinni. Not the ideal way to raise kids, but it's something common in some cultures. Even in English, someone is a, a bad person, he's referred to as a devil. That person is not an actual shaitan, his origin is not from fire, nor does the person mean that. It's just a term that's used to refer to someone who's wild or enraged 
or has bad habits or deen or akhlaq due to that nature resembling the nature of the shaitan. Ibn al-Jawzi and al-Dhahabi rahimahumullah stated that when Umar radiallahu an was on his way to liberate Bayt al-Maqdis in the famous story, he went humble in a stitched up thob and on the way there, they brought him a horse to ride. And he started walking with pride as horses tend to do at times. I spoke about that before, possibly in the istighfar classes. And I mentioned that khuyala in khayl, the term for pride and horses come from the same root word. Umar radiallahu anh told him, stop it, stop it. He got off and he said, I never knew people rode shayateen. Bring me my camel back. Did Umar mean radiallahu anh, that that horse was an actual shaitan? He said, ما كنت أظن الناس يركبون الشياطين. He meant the arrogant walk of that horse is a characteristic or something of the nature of the shayateen. Similar to that, some ulama said that the camel has some of the nature of the shayateen in them. So the point of the turn from making salat near the camel's resting places and refer, referring to them as being created from shayateen, فَإِنَّهَا خُلِقَتْ مِنَ الشَّيَاطِينَ is that some ulama said that if you make salah near the camels and they begin to rampage and act wild, that will interrupt someone's salah. Or the least of it is it will distract someone's khushu and concentration. So it was a term given to them due to their behavior. Their behavior has some of that, uh, the some of the nature of the shayateen. Now, sheep, on the other hand, are more calm and peaceful, and that may be why the Messenger وسلم, allowed salah near them. As to why the Messenger وسلم, made salah on the camel but deterred from salah near them, the reason is when one is near them, they tend to have shaitanic behaviors at time and go wild but when one is on them they're different and much more calm and peaceful and i relate to you this as opinions of ulama as i have no personal experience in this that's you know opinions of the ulama in what they mentioned ibn al-qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala said that every camel hump has a shaitan and it's created from shaitan so it has shaitanic powers He's saying that they're shaitanic and one who eats from something is affected by its nature. And here it's the nature of the shaitan. So he's basically saying those who eat from the camel's meat will be affected by that shaitanic touch or effect. And the shaitan is created from fire. Fire is turned off by water. And so the effect is turned off by water. So one should make wudu after eating from it. And that's the reason. Similar to that is like the issue of the anger. It's from the shaitan. Uh, and the devil was created from fire. And fire is extinguished by water. So when one becomes angry, should make wudu. Uh, it's, it's similar to that. However, it should be noted that that is not authentic hadith. The anger comes from the devil. And the devil was created from fire. And fire is extinguished by water. That is a weak hadith. The bottom line is some ulama said wudu is due to its shaitanic nature. To turn off that shaitanic nature. All these are guesses. There's no proof on the illa or reason for wudu from eating from the meat of the camel. The actual reason for wudu from a camel's meat is that it's ibadah. With no illa or cause or reason that we know of for sure. It's exactly similar to what Aisha radiallahu anha said about making up siyam and not salah after women are, are on their menstrual days. I mentioned the statements of the ulama, so you know them as talabat al-ilm. The summary of those opinions is that first of all, it's a matter of ibadah. That's the first opinion. The second one is because it's cooked on fire. And we said that's extremely weak. The third is because of their shaitanic nature. 
and there was slightly various explanations under that. Now the next nullifier, the final one that the author mentions, is ar-riddatu. He said war-riddatu, apostasy. Should we take it or stop it?